2 1 we are live now good evening welcome all uh, to the next episode of young surgeons forum and as you would have expected uh, an arthroplasty session we have arthroplasty imaging today uh, a topic that is uh, quite underplayed if i may say it has a lot of doubts a lot of uh, uh, pessimism amongst orthopedic surgeons about approaching radiologists about imaging and uh, i think we have the best man uh, in business who is who is an expert in musculoskeletal radiology uh, to tell us the importance of uh, how a radiologist can be one of the best friends of an orthopedic surgeon especially in in a very uh, in in a worse situation that you would expect in a pres- very prosthetic infection loosening etc so in this brief talk we have our expert dr aditya daftari Uh, speaking about arthroplasty imaging he practices out of uh, nm medical center and sports med and uh, he he is one of the best in in uh, musculoskeletal sonography as well as uh, uh, mri and and various imaging modalities and uh, i think he'll be the best person to talk about uh, uh, what do we need to know in in case of uh, arthroplasty imaging all over to you sir thank you so much i hope uh, all of you can hear me it's great to be first of all it's great to be part of this uh, forum i think uh, you know we always look forward to working with young orthopedic surgeons it's a lot of fun it's exciting i'm good friends with all orthopedic surgeons who send me scans no i'm just kidding <laughs> but uh, i uh, you know the i think this is an area that is that is uh, that is one that is fraught with enough confusion even amongst radiologists um, and what i'll be doing today is just adding to it which is my own uh, mix of confusion Uh, what i've tried to do is uh, sort of give you a little bit of an overview of how i go about approaching um, arthroplasty imaging when images come to me and uh, before i even go ahead with anything further the biggest question that i ask before doing anything when i'm reading a scan is i ask is this your patient or has this patient come to you from somebody else because if it's your patient <laughs> then i have to downplay everything but if it's come from somebody else then you want me to go to town on everything Well, again, no. I'm just kidding. I think the idea here really, really is for um, us to build some sort of structure on how we approach arthroplasty imaging when we get it. So, um, so what I'm going to start about talking about is when we talk about post arthroplasty problems, uh, we have a few different things we look at. We want to look at the prosthesis integrity. We want to look at the interface, um, you know, between the bone and the prosthesis. We want to look at the synovium. We want to look at the soft tissue restraints, the neurovascular structures. and then positional abnormalities um some technical considerations before we go ahead i think radiographs you are all aware of uh, often times with arthroplasty more than with routine radiography we want to get more obliques and other angled views because we'd like to look at structures from different angles uh, and see what their rotation etc is when it comes to ct um, it's a great tool to use but because there's metal there can be a lot of streak artifact the artifact varies based on materials and the ways to reduce the artifact are by increasing the kv um, or the energy of the beam um, and by using some metal artifact reduction software as well as doing very thin section images um mri is believe it or not a fantastic tool in fact i would put mri next after x rays most of the time in my evaluation of an arthroplasty patient um, and i think it's a extremely valuable tool um in terms of whether to use a 1.5 or a 3t scanner this is one of the few situations where you may prefer to use a 1.5t scanner over a 3t scanner because the metallic artifact is a bit less um we use some fancy imaging techniques which can involve metal artifact reduction um we use some high resolution imaging techniques we try and image on multiple cycles to get better images um and you can believe it or not you can scan very early after an arthroplasty you'll hear a lot of radiology centers tell you no we can't put an arthroplasty into the mr scanner you can put it as soon as 24 to 48 hours after your surgery if you need to so it's not an issue you can put a patient who has an arthroplasty for a brain scan a shoulder scan or anything else and you can pay to put a patient who has a knee arthroplasty for a knee mri also so all these things are possible the only thing to be aware of sometimes because of the techniques you can have overheating so patients are warned when they go into the scanner that listen you could have some heating if you feel warm let us know and we'll reduce it or change things in the scan some things that are important in terms of imaging prostheses if you have based on the kind of metal the artifact increases so for example cobalt chrome will have enormous artifact but on the other hand something like zirconium or oxygenium will have much less artifact uh, the geometry of the of the component also makes a difference so for example if you have a linear rod 
then that tends not to produce as much artifact. But if you have a rounded structure, that tends to produce. So the femoral head can produce a lot of artifact, but the femoral stem will produce less artifact. Um, some other things to remember are where the joint is within the gantry. So if you go put a knee inside the gantry, you can bring the knee to the middle of the circle of the gantry because you can just move it that way. And that tends to reduce artifact. Whereas with a hip and a shoulder, it's harder to do that. So you may get more artifacts with that. Nuclear medicine is kind of important and interesting, especially when we look at infection imaging. And while we've used old techniques like white blood scale, cell scans, and we've used um, you know, uh, bone scans and we've used uh, gallium and we've used sulfur colloid and a bunch of these things. The key thing today in today's day and age is we use fluorodeoxyglucose PET. And uh, that's got the main thing you have to remember from that is a positive PET is very non-specific, but a negative PET has got great negative predictive value. So in other words, if you're concerned about a low grade infection in somebody and you want to get a, you know, you want to make sure that there's no infection, do a PET CT scan. If you get zero uptake, you're clean. But if you get mild uptake, then you're still sort of stuck and waffling. So use it when you are very likely to get a negative response. And that's sort of when it will help you to make that final answer. Ultrasound is really good for looking at superficial soft tissues and for doing joint aspiration. So I find I use these a lot for that. So here's an example. Here you have three MRI scans. Uh, can you see my pointer on the screen? Here? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. All right. So here you have three MRI scans. Uh, here you can see a patient who did not have any metal artifact reduction uh, protocols followed. And it's actually a pretty, um, you know, this is an, uh, uh, you know, not cobalt chrome. This would probably be titanium or something like that, which has still got this much artifact. And then here, when we used metal artifact suppression protocols, you can see how much better the definition and how much less the all this streak artifact is, or this magnetic susceptibility artifact is. And then this is somebody who has an auxinium or a zirconium implant, and you can see how the artifact is complete, almost completely gone. Okay, so this is just to explain to you how images look different based on some of these parameters. Here's how we used to look at um, infection in the past. You have an X-ray showing destructive bone here. You have a, a bone scan where on the arterial phase, you can see a little bit of increased uptake. On the uh, blood pool, you can see a little bit of increased uptake. And then when you get to the delayed images, you can see uptake all along the acetabular cup as well as the femoral stem. And this would be typically interpreted as an infected prosthesis. Okay. Here's another example though, where you have somebody who's had a fluorodeoxyglucose scan. So this is a glucose metabolic uptake. You see this intense uptake in the femoral head and your instant inclination is to say this is osteomyelitis in the femoral head because the PET is positive. But as it turns out, if you look at the CT, which is not the greatest quality, you can see the subchondral cystic change. And actually this is nothing more than osteoarthritis. And so this is acute exacerbation of osteoarthritis with a little bit of inflammatory response, which is producing this intense uptake. So remember FDG, all that glitters is not gold. Every time it's positive, it doesn't mean it's infection. Uh, but if you have a negative FDG scan, then that's a really good predictor that there is not infection. So in the old days, we used to look at a bone scan seeing positive. We could be for multiple reasons. We would do a white blood cell scan. If that was positive, it could be from infection or sometimes a little bit of loosening. And then we would do sulfur, sulfur colloid imaging. And I'll show you an example of how this works a little later on. But in today's day and age, very much we do FDG PET. If there's no uptake, we're all clear. If there's low uptake, then it still could be infection, inflammation, stress. It's a very non-specific thing. And if you have high uptake, then you're more likely to say this could be infection or a very highly metabolically active process. So what's the approach to arthroplasty imaging? I think the first thing that when I look at any plasty imaging is I look for prosthetic and periprosthetic integrity. So I look to see if there are fractures or breakages in the metal. Um, and for this X-ray and CT are probably the most important. MR is less useful in this situation. The next thing I look, it as, I look at is the gross prosthesis position. Is it appropriately located? Is it a little bit tilted? Is it off? And I find that particularly useful. So if I see if the tip is going to the cortex, if this abnormal angulation, then that's something that I really get concerned about. Um, I also, in those cases, will tend to go back and look at the old images to check and see that, you know, was, the, was this change from the previous one? And again, their X-rays and CTs are more important. Next, I look at the bone prosthesis interface because we're concerned about loosening, osteolysis, um, you know, membrane formation. And there I find CT and MR to be very, very helpful as well as old X-rays. And when you can start to be concerned about infection, then PET CT or you know, nuclear medicine studies become a little bit more important. When we're thinking about soft tissues, um, we want to see the soft tissue restraints 
On X-rays, we basically look at abnormal opening of joints. You see widening of the medial joint space, so you see the patella subluxed off in some place, and you think that there's soft tissue discontinuity. But um, otherwise, MR and CTR, MR especially is excellent for delineating actual soft tissues. And um, ultrasound is very good for superficial structures because many of, especially in the knee, many of the structures are superficial. So we can use ultrasound to look at those. Um, next, I always focus on the synovium. I think the character of the synovium is very important in understanding what's going on with the joint. And then finally, we can look at things like axial alignment, which help us to determine why a prosthesis is failing. So I'll get on with talking about prosthesis integrity. Actual prosthesis fracturing uh, is unusual in isolation. They're usually associated with an element of osteolysis or mechanical overload. Otherwise, they don't tend to give way. Liner, on the other hand, gets worn very often and it can slip out of place. So, so that can happen. When we think about uh, periprosthetic fractures, we have a bunch of different periprosthetic fractures. They could be apophyseal. They could involve the supporting bed. They could be completely clear of the implant. They could be through the implant. Um, or they could be periprosthetic, or they could be through the prosthesis interface. So here I find radiographs with multiple obliquities are helpful. And then CT plays an important role when you use metal artifact reduction techniques to actually identify subtle fractures. And I'll show you some examples of that now. So here's an example of an apophyseal fracture. This is radiographically occult, but when you look at the CT, you see this linear line. Now, when you see this line, again, you're hard pressed to call this a fracture. I would also not necessarily call this a fracture in isolation. But when I look at the MR, I can see the line again, and I see a lot of bone marrow edema here on the MR. So to me now, this is a great non-displaced, great fracture. Here on the other hand, we have a scout image from the uh, CT, and you can see maybe there's a little lift off of bone here. I'm not entirely sure that there's a fracture, but when you look at the CT uh, cuts, and when you look at the CT sections, and you can see the reformatted images, it's very clear that there's a fracture, and you can say that the fracture is just above the level of the femoral component, and you can give people whatever details they want on the fracture as far as management. Here's a patient who had a fracture that, I mean, this was plate, this, I didn't have the pre-plating fracture uh, x-ray, but here's a patient who we've been following over the last few months who had a fracture that was remote from the site of the prosthesis. So this is typically managed in the same way that you would manage any fracture in that particular location. Now here's a fracture where you go through the prosthesis. So, you know, it's, it's a cross, it's a very interprosthetic fracture, prosthetic fracture. You can see that there is a fracture through the bone. You can see this prosthesis here. But when you start to look at the bone, what you can see, there's scalloping of this bone here. And when you see the scalloping of the bone here, you know that there's an element of underlying osteolysis here, which is probably why this whole thing got, got loose and then ultimately fractured. So when you see fractures that go through prosthesis, obviously you want to know the status of the underlying bone. And that's where CT can be particularly helpful. Now, here's an interesting case which I had over years. Here is a ceramic hip prosthesis. You can see the liner in here. When you do this follow-up x-ray, you can see that the liner has slipped out of its expected location. So it's not within the cup. And when you look at it still further on, you can see this linear lucency through the liner, which is essentially a fracture through the ceramic cup. So this is a nice example of how liner can displace and then ultimately fracture. Um, here's an example of somebody who has a, an, a prosthetic fracture. So here's a fracture through the, through the femoral implant here itself. And this is somebody at a dislocation, and that's because this acetabular cup is too far antiverted. So the first part of the talk, which I tried to do, is show you uh, prosthetic and periprosthetic integrity fractures and how we look at them and how mainly CT and X-rays will be helpful. X-rays are really good with multiple obliquities, but you will want to get CTs oftentimes to look at these in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is the gross prosthetic position. So when we see angulation or abnormalities of position of the prosthesis, it should sort of trigger something in our brains. And oftentimes, this is something when you see in isolation, you won't pick up. But when you see a trend of multiple radiographs, especially the immediate post-operative radiograph, these things catch your eye a little bit more easily. So you can have periprosthetic positional abnormalities that could be gross, like this case here, where this cup is completely displaced out and this complete dislocation. You could have something slightly more subtle where you have the superior migration of the femoral head within the acetabular cup and it's a completely polyethylene cup. You can have situations where you have this tibial stem just sort of tipping off laterally and abutting the cortex down here. Or you could have this one where again, this tibial stem is just tipping a little bit laterally. So in this case, obviously, no doubt there's a problem. This case, yes, there's a problem. If you're not thinking about liner wear, you wouldn't pick this up. This case, yeah, it looks like this is off. This case, 
you're questioning, is this real or not? It would be good to have an original post-procedural X-ray to show that this has changed a little bit. Okay. So when you see abnormal position, obviously compare it with the priors, especially the immediate post-operative study to see if that is new. And when you see abnormal position, it's usually because of two things. A, the abnormal position can be caused because of poor osteointegration. So because you have poor osteointegration, the prosthesis migrates into an abnormal position. Or B, the prosthesis was placed abnormally. And as a result of that, you have abnormal loading patterns, and that will ultimately lead to prosthetic failure. So anytime you see abnormal position, you need to compare to the old study and you want to look for signs of prosthetic uh, failure. And that you're typically going to look very carefully at the bone prosthesis or the cement prosthesis interface. So here's sort of an example of a case where you have a femoral uh, prosthesis. You can see that the tip is slightly more lateral in the coronal plane. On the sagittal plane, it's quite nicely centered within the shaft. If you look at this, you can see that as this is coming out, it is this medial cortex that is starting to get a little bit of remodeling and sclerosed. Okay, so this is just remodeling bone in that area because it's bearing down extra load. Ideally, sometimes you would also tend to see this more laterally because that's where you tend to get the fractures as this continues on. On the other hand, here's a sagittal image. You can see this is the line of the prosthesis. Now, what I've done here is I've drawn the same line of the prosthesis here. And if you look at this a little bit carefully, you see the line of force is coming to the posterior acetabulum. And if you look at this acetabular cup carefully, you see the anterior acetabulum, the bone is normal. The posterior acetabulum, you can see that there is sclerosis of bone here, indicating that there is chronic stress. Okay. So this is just on imaging how we can look at stress by looking at geometry and then by looking at where we see sclerosis compared to other sides. These things are subtle and this is more just to explain things to you. But, you know, this is some of the things that we can look at. But let's look at this one. This is a slightly more gross case. If you were to look at this hip, you would say this is the worst one because you've got liner wear here. But when you look at the femoral stem, it's appropriately located within the center of the shaft. If you look at the opposite side here, there's less liner wear. If you look at the femoral stem, it's abutting the lateral cortex here of the femoral shaft. And what's interesting over here is when you look at the CT image, you can see this is the, this is the prosthesis. This is the cement. You can see the prosthesis cement interface is nice and the cement bone interface is also nice. Whereas if you look at this side, you can very clearly see that there's a clear lucency along the cement prosthesis interface. You can see that there's angulation here along the inferior cement prosthesis interface, indicating sort of a fracture in the cement itself. And this has gone out. So you, and this is all lucency up here. So this entire prosthesis is loose and that's why it sort of subluxed or changed its position in that way. So anytime you see abnormal position, start to look for sclerosis or lucency because they could be coming. Sclerosis would be stress related. Lucencies will be osteolysis or failure related. Here's another person who's got osteolysis. And here you can see that the osteoprosthesis is actually subluxed out and it's actually coming out. So it's completely loose. So in this case, you are talking about the prosthesis just becoming completely loose because the osteolysis or the loosening or the poor osteointegration has gone along the entire surface area of the prosthesis. So the second part of the talk, what I've tried to talk to you about is about gross prosthesis position. Look at prosthesis position, compare it to the old study and look for sclerosis or lucencies that can help you to determine whether this is a prosthetic failure that is going into failure because of abnormal stress or this is going into, or this has got poor osteointegration and therefore it's going into failure. Now, the next part of this talk is about the bone prosthesis interface. And to me, I think this is something that's really, really important. So I'd like all of you to pay attention to this bit of this, of this talk. So when we think about the bone prosthesis interface on x-rays, we're looking for a smooth lucency, which typically will happen at the pivot points because that's where it tends to loosen, wherever there's maximum loading. Um, and that's lucency. And that can come because of membrane formation or can come because of early loosening. The next thing that you have is scalloping, which is where you actually have big bites of bone that are taken out. And that is because of osteolysis. So I think there are maybe two or three things that everybody needs to remember here. A, when you have a periprosthetic lucency, which is slender and goes along much of the prosthesis, then that you would consider to be in the category of membrane formation or poor osteointegration. But well, that's the terminology that I will use. If you see large bites of bone that are taken out, then those are the things that we will talk about as osteolysis. Now, membrane formation and osteolysis 
can both exist with or without loosening. So if you have membrane formation that involves a significant length or significant surface area of the prosthesis, or if you have osteolysis that involves a significant surface area of the of the, of the prosthesis, <coughs> excuse me, then we will call it loosening. But if we just see an isolated focus here or there, then we don't call it loosening. We just say there's poor osteointegration along this space or that space or the other space, or there's osteolysis along this area or that area, but we wouldn't necessarily call it loosening. On MRI, the equivalent of these things is on, you know, uh, of, of membrane formation is a slender fluid signal lucency or, uh, you know, fluid signal uh, area. And on scalloping is what you'll see with osteolysis. Now, anytime we see these two entities, we look at a few different questions, or at least I ask myself a few different questions. <coughs> Excuse me. The first thing is, is this real? Am I just making up this lucency? Is there really a lucency or not? And there, um, you know, looking at the old images really helps me. If I see old images, the lucency wasn't there. Now it's there. I start to get more concerned about it. There was a minor lucency. It's increased. I get more concerned about it. The prosthesis has changed position. I get more concerned about it. The second thing is somebody says, this is painful. There's definitely got to be osteolysis or there's definitely got to be poor membrane formation or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, am I missing it? And in that case, I look at the x-ray and say, listen, I don't see any evidence of loosening or osteolysis or, or um, membrane formation. But in that case, if you're really concerned about it, we should consider getting a CT or an MRI. The third thing is once you start to see it, is there infection associated with it? And finally, what's the status of the bone stock? What's the percentage of the prosthetic surface area that's involved? And what is the bone around it? Because if I change this, what am I going to be left to play with? So here's abnormal bone prosthesis interface on an X-ray. Here you can see under surface of the tibial tray along the cement, you can see that there's lucency here. And this could be a little bit of osteolysis or membrane formation. Here you can see along the cement prosthesis interface, that there's a lucency that's narrower up here and wider down here. And as this thing is moved sort of laterally, that is abnormal, of course. On the other hand, here on the femoral side of the same patient, you can see a large area of scallop bone here, which is going to be osteolysis. So this would be potentially membrane formation or poor osteointegration, and this would be osteolysis. Let's look at the CT equivalent of a patient with that. You can see here along the cement, bone interface that you have a clear lucency and this would be membrane formation or poor osteointegration. If you were to think about it, it's involving almost the entire prosthesis. Ideally, you would say if I pull this, it would just come out, but it's not completely gone loose towards the inferior tip. So maybe you have to juggle it or wiggle it a bit before it comes out. But sometimes you see the lucency going all the way inferiorly as well. And pretty much when you go in surgically, you just hold it and it just comes out in your hand. Okay, So this would be poor osteointegration along the cement prosthesis interface, cement uh, bone cement interface, which has led to loosening. On the other hand here, you can see this large area of bony scalloping here, here, as well as here. And these are all areas of osteolysis, which have occurred as a result of this polyethylene liner wear, leading to a uh, particulate synovitis, which then leads to osteolysis along this bone. And so this is not so much of a mechanical process. And this prosthesis won't be loose because it's just this proximal portion that's involved the lower part of the entire process is actually well integrated. So if you went in, you may not be able to just pull this out as easily. And this is probably an area that, the, that you are maybe less familiar with, which is here on this MRI, you can see nicely that this irregularity is the cement here. This is the bone. And you can see what there's a really nice, I mean, the bone and the cement are almost flush with each other. So this is normal. If you look at this very carefully, you'll see that there's a slender gray area that surrounds the entire course of the tibial stem, right? And this slender gray area is nothing more than membrane formation or poor osteointegration. And therefore this prosthesis is actually loose. And finally here, when you look at this one, you can see that there's big chunks of scalloped, you know, bone here, and this is actually osteolysis. And since it's involving almost the entire tibial stem, I wouldn't be surprised if this one is loose. Now, the question that we often get asked is what would you prefer CT or MRI to look for osteolysis? And the answer really is it depends on your experience and how good you are looking at this, what your scanners are, what your imaging techniques are and a bunch of different things. The advantage of an MRI is that you can see not just the bone, but you can see a lot of the soft tissue structures as well. 
the advantage uh, the disadvantage is that sometimes because of metal artifact you don't see everything all together you have to sort of see piecemeal from one obliquity to a, you know from one act section as an axial coronal sagittal so you may have to look at it in multiple different angles to figure it out ct on the other hand can be very obvious but sometimes it can be subtle but it shows you everything all at once so here for example is somebody who has gross osteolysis here along the uh, superolateral acetabulum and if you look on the mr you may not pick it up but you can see that there's an area of osteolysis here through this artifact on the other hand here's a ct where you would say that well is there anything going on in this bone this just looks like normal bone but on the mri you can see this fairly obvious area of large osteolysis over here so it really depends on what you are more comfortable with looking at and um you know each of them do have their advantages in separate situations so oftentimes we do a ct and an mri on patients when we have this because that way we can look at both things simultaneously now there are also some prosthesis interface related changes that are more evident on mr or ct that you wouldn't pick up on an x ray so these are all patients with normal x rays in this here you can see maybe a little bit of sclerosis along the calcar here but you can see that there's edema here so this is a stress reaction so it's stress overloading along the calcar Similarly, here on CT, you don't see anything much, but you can see a clear fluid signal that is tracking along this um, this prosthesis, and therefore there could be some loosening of the femoral stem. And in this case, you can see this large area of osteolysis along the posterior aspect of the femoral component at towards the calcar, and you can see the osteolysis because it's thinning of the cortex on the CT as well. But you may be hard pressed to pick this up on an X-ray otherwise. And now people may say that MR is good because we can see bone stress because you can see bone edema. And here's an example where you can see somebody who got a relatively normal X-ray and CT, but on the MR you can see edema, and so you could postulate that this patient has a bone stress reaction. But let's look at the converse case. Here is that case which I showed you with the abnormal, slightly abnormal positioning. You can see that there's a lot of sclerosis in the bone, and when you see this kind of sclerosis, you know that there's chronic stress happening, right? chronic stress won't show up with bone marrow edema so you'll be hard pressed to see it on an mri you would see it on a ct as chronic stress and if you wanted to know this sclerosis is actually symptomatic or not or this could be a cause of the issues you can do a bone scan and the bone scan will show you that there's increased uptake in the areas of stress loading so that's a place where nuclear medicine could come become useful when you have case of chronic stress um, and you want to sort of know if that if that sclerosis is actually metabolically active or is, is has got active bone turnover <clears throat> Here's another example. We have a patient of you know where you have this little subsidence of the tibial stem. We, I showed you this case earlier on. Uh, you look at the images here on the MR. You can see this gross subsidence. You can see clearly that there's a fluid cleft between the cement as well as the prosthesis down here, and therefore this is clear loosening of this um, of this prosthetic prosthetic component here. So this is a nice example of loosening, which is hard to pick up on an X-ray. Only by this subtle positional abnormality, but when you look at the MRI, you can see that it's clearly um, a moved off position. You can clearly identify that there is loosening. Now, here's another example. This is the normal knee, which is the opposite side, and this is the symptomatic knee. You can see these areas of bone scalloping here, and you can tell that there's osteolysis. Your initial thing is to say this is osteolysis with definite loosening, but when you look at the CT, you can see yeah, there's osteolysis along the tibial stem. You can see it anteriorly along the tibial tray. I'm sorry, along the tibial tray here and anterior along the tibial stem. I'm sorry, uh, laterally along the tibial stem. But you can see that otherwise here, how this is osteolysis. Here you can see this is sclerosis because of stress loading. But otherwise, the bone prosthesis interface is pretty good. So this is not yet loose. I mean, there's no doubt that you have to do something about this. You're not going to wait for this osteolysis to progress further. But it gives you a sense for what is the nature of the bone stock under here when you go back and what you're going to have to deal with. <clears throat> Um, whenever we have cases of osteolysis or loosening, we've got some good systems in place for some of these uh, joints, especially the hip, where you can use your Dilly and Shanley zones, or we can use Gruen zones to tell you what zones are involved, so you know what the degree of osteolysis is, where you're going to run into problems, and how much bone stock you have to play with. Um, here is an example of someone who's got osteolysis along the tibial stem. You see this large area of osteolysis here. But interestingly, when you look at this, you see the tibial cortex here, and you see how it's thickened over here. And because of this scallop bone, the weakening, the abnormal forces, this person has actually developed a little bit of a stress fracture in that cortex. And this is the case I showed you earlier, where you have this osteolysis and you have complete displacement of the prosthetic component, your prosthetic migration. <clears throat> 
So the next question that comes up usually is, is there infection? Here on x-rays, we look for aggressive bone destruction or soft tissue gas, similarly on CTs. But if that's happened, then clinically, it's very obvious because it's an aggressive acute infection. Most of the time we're looking for, is there chronic infection? Is there mild infection? Um, MRI can be helpful to us because it can show us, you know, lysis. It can show us bone marrow edema. It can show us the status of the synovium, which I'll talk to you later about in a couple of minutes. PET CT is good. If you have a negative PET CT, you're rocking it. You really don't need to worry about anything. If you have a positive PET CT, you're still stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. So one way of thinking about it is when you have a low clinical index suspicion of, uh, of infection, <clears throat> or a very low one, and you know that there's no major active bone turnover going on, then you might consider getting a PET CT because it's helpful. Then it just tells you, okay, fine, I'm all good. Let's go. Um, I talk, we'll, we'll show, I'll show you an example of how bone scans and, and, and WB scan, BC scans work. Serum markers are obviously something that all of you have to get and look at things like CRP and white cell counts and things like that. And finally, aspiration uh, of joints. And that's another place where I think image guidance is very helpful because oftentimes these joints are dry and you don't get much or you have to sort of finagle and get into different corners of it and try and find fluid. And that's where imaging can really be helpful. Now here's an example of a tagged white blood cell scan. So you can see these are vessels. You can see this is bone marrow, which has increased uptake. And you see on the right side, as compared to the left, there is increased uptake along the lateral aspect of the femur. And this is actually all because this is a periarticular abscess, oh, sorry, a periosseous abscess. So this is a periprosthetic abscess that we had. And, and that's demonstrated on a white cell scan. On the other hand, you have this situation here where you had a, you have a hip replacement, you have a femoral stem prosthesis. Um, and the prosthesis results in marrow packing along its inferior tip. So because there's increased marrow with white cells, you can have increased uptake on the white cell scan. But when we do a sulfur colloid scan, which is a scan that goes and attaches to marrow itself, you can see there's also increased uptake in the marrow over here. So this has got uptake on the white cell scan as well as the sulfur colloid scan, which means that this is just marrow packing. It's not infection. Had this been dark and we just had uptake on the white cell scan, but no uptake on the sulfur colloid scan, then we would say this is probably infection. So we've talked a little bit about the bone prosthesis interface, and now we'll move on to the soft tissue restraints and the soft tissue structures. So when we think of radiographs, the classic way that we look for soft tissue failure is to see joint space widening or patellar dislocation displacement. And those are things that tell us that uh, there is soft tissue failure. Um, MR is actually fantastic with looking at the soft tissue, CT not so much so, but here, for example, we can see that there's a unicompartmental arthroplasty and you can see the popliteus tendon has come off here. Here's somebody, we can see a clear rupture of the quadriceps mechanism. The same patient, when you look at the patient, you can see that there's clear tearing here of the patellofemoral ligament and retinaculum with abnormal patellar tilt and position. This is a patient where you can see the MCL has come off from its femoral attachment. And then this is another case where you can see the MCL has actually come out from its tibial attachment. So we can see the soft tissue restraints really, really nicely on MRI in multiple different planes. Um, ultrasound is also great. So here is an example of a normal quadriceps tendon going to the patella. And here is an example of somebody's patella here. And you see this big scar tissue here and you don't see patella tendon going all the way across. And this is an example of a quadriceps tendon rupture. Another soft tissue abnormality that we're concerned about is heterotopic ossification, which can sometimes cause pain and discomfort. And here see when we see a lot of bone muscle edema in somebody who's had a hip replacement, which is, you know, not very, very recent, then we can look for areas that are ill-defined calcification and these we can confirm on CT and this could be heterotopic ossification. Now, when we see heterotopic ossification, there's obviously two things that tend to happen. One is they mature, they mature and they start to bridge across. And for that, we use the broker cast classification typically to see if there's bridging ossification. But when you want to deal with the stiffness of ossification, you want to make sure that that ossification is mature. <coughs> Excuse me, because if you go into immature ossification, then you're more likely to just exacerbate the problem later on. So in those situations, what one ends up doing is one can obviously look for muscle edema on MR, which can be challenging. Alternatively, you can do a nuclear medicine scan. When you do a nuclear medicine bone scan, if there is heterotopic ossification, you will see active bony turnover and you will see increased uptake. And once that stuff settles, then you will cease to see all this increased bony uptake <coughs> excuse me, in the soft tissues. Um, 
Other soft tissues that we are concerned about are the neurovascular structures. So with MR, you can see the neurovascular structures very well. You can see these superficial ones with ultrasound also. And here's an example from the literature of a normal um, uh, uh, peroneal nerve. And here's a thickened and edematous and, you know, partly injured peroneal nerve. Um, here is an example that we saw recently where you can see this patient. You can see the sciatic nerve here is thickened and edematous. And when you look at the CT, you can see that there is newborn formation or heterotopic ossification almost encasing that sciatic nerve. And you can see that there's big mature heterotopic ossification running around the back of the hip here, which is the cause for that. So we can tell you, you know, sort of that there's nerve involvement, what the degree of nerve involvement is and what it's coming from. Here's another example of somebody who developed ischiofemoral impingement. And, you know, we see ischiofemoral impingement as imaging all the time. And this is a narrowing of the ischiofemoral space. But in this case, when you start to see thickening and edema along the sciatic nerve itself, then we're more inclined to believe that this is symptomatic ischiofemoral impingement. Here's an example of somebody who had an anterior approach surgery, and this is scarring and ma magnetic susceptibility artifact along the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which sort of explains why this patient may have anterior symptoms. So when you're thinking about the soft tissues, remember we're thinking about the soft tissue restraints on X-ray about abnormal widening and, and movement of structures. Um, MR is excellent for doing this. Ultrasound can be fantastic for looking at the superficial structures for sure. Um, and the neurovascular structures we can see on MR or on ultrasound. Now we move on to the important part, which is synovium. And uh, here, I think when we think about synovial pathology, we think about focal synovial pathology, like things that cause a patellar clunk. We think of vascular malformations or vascular tangles, which can bleed and lead to recurrent hemarthrosis. And then we can think of diffuse uh, reactive particulate or in fact, in inflammatory synovitides. So here's an example of a patient who has a unicompartmental arthroplasty. You see this small cystic area and somebody may say this is probably degenerative. We look at the MR, you can see there's a sizable effusion. Some of this is thickened. And this patient turned out to be somebody who had rheumatoid arthritis who had a unicompartmental arthroplasty and then a reactivation of her arthritis. This is someone who had a patellar clunk and you can see this diffuse scarring in the suprapatellar pouch here, which they went in and then resected to deal with the clunk. This is somebody again who you can see there's a lot of thickening of this synovium and how fast fat fat here and along the back here. And this is a person who had a stiff knee and this ended up being arthrofibrosis. So there's no joint effusion. You just see very thick and clunky synovium. This is an interesting case. We've had a few of these where we see recurrent hemarthrosis after uh, total knee arthroplasties. And what we can do is we can do these MR angiograms, which are dynamic. And if you look at, oops, sorry, if you look at this one, um, what you'll see is that as the dynamic contrast comes in, superolaterally here, there's a tangle of vessels that fills up. And it's that filling vessel that is the cause of this recurrent bleed. And then an interventional radiologist can go in and actually just embolize this vessel. And when it's embolized, you can deal with the hematosis and the bleed goes away. And they have very, very good outcomes with this. <clears throat> the axial images on the MRI are a great place to look for the synovium because the suprapatellar synovial lining is really, really helpful. So you can have a thin synovium like this with a little bit of nodularity, which you call a smooth reactive synovium. Here you can have a thicker, but homogeneously thick synovium, which would be called a reactive synovitis. Here you can have small little particles. So when you see polyethylene liner where you can see a particulate synovitis like this, sometimes you can actually see little linear shards like you see like this of polyethylene. And then sometimes you can see very heterogeneous synovium like this, which you would see in somebody who's got an infectious synovitis. Um, when we think about patients who have hip arthroplasties, we look at fluid around the hip. So we can have some common areas of fluid around the hip. One is along the iliopsoas bursa and two is along the greater trochanteric bursa. And it's not unusual in patients with hip, hip arthroplasties to have fluid in both these locations. And oftentimes we see it tracking and communicating with the joint. Here's somebody where you can see a large, this is sort of a little bit of osteolysis along the acetabular cup. And you see a little bit of fluid down here, but it's a large collection along the femoral shaft. And this is a post-operative abscess that had formed. Here is somebody who had, uh, you know, a, a, a rupture of their hamstring tendon as a result of which they developed a large hematoma in the back here. So you can see sometimes these kind of things. So it was a quadriceps muscle anteriorly. Um, then you can have 
when you just like with the knee you can look at the synovium you can have thin synovial lining like this you can have thick reactive you can have a synovitis like this with small particulate debris or you can have a very solid sort of synovium here which is typical for what you would see with alval so a more solid kind of synovitis here. um i'm going to skip this slide now you know sometimes we sort of looking for clues for infection and what's interesting is we can not only see here in this case of a knee arthroplasty that there's poor osteointegration along the undersurface of the tibial tray but if you track this out you can see that it actually communicates through that into a sinus tract that goes to the skin so this is the degree of resolution that we can get on a good mr to show you that undersurface and to show it communicating with the exterior and if you go up and look at the suprapatellar pouch you look at the synovium you can see it's ugly shaggy synovium with areas of osteolysis in the back here and so that again gives us greater um, confidence that this is infection here's a patient with an infected hip you can see poor osteointegration because the infection is tracked along the entire femoral stem you can see that there's an uh, there's sort of heterogeneous uh, tissue here as well and if you look at the bone itself on a ct you can see it's got that mottled appearance which you often see with osteomyelitis so this is all these are all signs of uh, infection image carried aspirations are great to do um, we can see the fluid in the suprapatellar pouch here get a needle into it and aspirate it and this is a case i did maybe 2 days ago which was interesting to me when i saw this because we put a needle in i was inside the joint completely i could see the needle inside the joint and i was not getting any aspirate and what it made me do then was to pull out again and just jab through and maybe i was just tenting the synovium maybe i hadn't gone through the synovium but i managed to change my positions a little bit and i actually got a good 20 cc out of the joint so being able to directly visualize where your needle is rather than just jabbing around sometimes in the dark uh, is a good way to ensure that you'll get fluid around this i've also done a bunch of hips you know where i'm interested where i know i'm at the head neck junction or i know i'm at the hip joint i don't see anything and i just pop behind the head neck i can see on the ultrasound and i'm in the posterior recess and whoop suddenly you get a lot of fluid around there so <clears throat> some of these things are helpful uh, imaging in terms of aspirations so just in terms of synovium when you look at synovium and you're thinking about infection or inflammation if you have a very heterogeneous edematous thickened synovium then mr is very helpful on ultrasound you may see thick heterogeneous synovium sometimes you may see vascularity in the synovium which would indicate infection alternatively you can use image guidance for aspiration and the fdg pet scan is a useful scan but remember the number of times that you come back with a completely negative scan is small uh, but if you do then that's gold <clears throat> if you don't get a negative scan then you're still back to square one a little bit so we've talked a little bit of the synovium now the last thing we'll talk about is axial alignment on mr we can see all the landmarks that we need to to look at the axial alignment of a knee component um on c on mr we're not so lucky with the hip because we see a lot of artifact and if you want to measure acetabular angulations femoral version and things like that then we really do need to use a do ct for that um i think the key thing to ask for all of you i think there is a constant complaint from orthopedic surgeons that radiologists don't give us measurements we don't know what we want i think the good thing for you to do is to mention what measurements you want and what information you're looking for from a scan remember an arthroplasty scan is a complicated scan i mean it's a case that's complicated at the outset the more information all of us have when we're dealing with it the better off we are in giving answers so if you're able to articulate what you want make a phone call speak to somebody and from a radiologist side also you know what i do often times i'll call up if i'm concerned about some cells and i'm seeing x y or z what do you think you know and and we communicate that's how we learn that's how we also go forward with this it's a complicated space and it's got a lot of challenges to it so that's sort of an overview on how i would look at arthroplasty imaging um to conclude i'll tell you that we have many tools available in arthroplasty uh, to look at plasties but we need you to articulate your question what are you looking for that's helpful to us in addition we would find our own things i think um, for young orthopedic surgeons a very very important take home point is make sure you compare with old studies if you're not doing that that's a really really helpful thing to do and especially the immediate post operative x ray that's that's probably the a key one to look at if you see any positional abnormalities it's either a sign of impending or something that could be going towards failure or there's something that is causing it to be in an abnormal position which means there could be some abnormal osteointegration ct and mri are both important tools in assessing the bone prosthesis interface <clears throat> some occasions one is better than the other so we tend to use both simultaneously 
MR is fabulous for looking at the soft tissues. You can use ultrasound for superficial soft tissues. FTG PET is the state of the art today when we're looking at infection. But even in that, if you have a negative study, then that's got great, you know, that's, that's really, really good for you. It's got a very good negative predictive value. But if you have a positive study, then you're still sort of stuck a little bit, unless it's grossly positive, in which case you say it has the most likely infection. Um, and ultrasound is really, or even x-rays or fluoroguided aspirations are really helpful when you have uh, things where you want to get fluid out and you're not really sure how to get it. So that's all I really have to talk to you guys about. I hope this gives you a little overview on how I look at arthroplasty imaging um, and gives you some clue in terms of how you might want to approach it as you go forward. Sure. Uh, a very, very, very good articulate talk, a very rational uh talk on how do we go about imaging and when do we uh, select <clears throat> our modality of, of imaging. So a few questions that we have on our mind is when do we do a contrast MR and when do we not? Uh, so any, any uh, tips for that? Well, I think for the most part, when we're looking at our studies, we do a non-contrast study. Um, uh, we find that we're looking, you know, even if we're looking for infection, oftentimes we, a non-contrast study suffices to give us a lot of information. We always ask ourselves, why are we doing contrast? So if we find that on the non-contrast study, we can't delineate a collection, we can't delineate some structure in particular, these studies already have enough artifacts in them. So if we add on an element of contrast to it, what are we gaining from it? So in the, in the vast majority, I would say, leave that decision to the radiologist. I would say, say you're looking for infection, say you're looking for this, and, and always write there or explain to your patients that, look, the radiologist may ask you to get contrast. So one of the things that happens conversationally is that the radiologist will do a study. Usually if there's contrast, there's an additional charge involved. Then the patient says, oh, but my doctor never told me this. So you tell them, isn't the radiologist? I've asked them what to look for. They will do a scan. Sometimes they will need to give you contrast, in which case they'll charge you something more for that. But sometimes they just manage without that. So they'll take that call once they start looking at your scan and decide whether you need it or not. Obviously, in a situation where you have somebody who's got recurrent hemarthrosis and you want to do an angiogram to look for whether there's a bleed or not, in those cases, you're definitely going to ask for contrast. But then you'll just say MR angiogram to look for a uh, bleeder. Right. So in cases of deep lesions where there are there is only maybe say hip diffusion in a post-THR case, mm -hmm. which is very minimal, uh, a sonography will be an inadequate modality to find that or localize the needle. Not really. Uh, okay, Not we can still do that with with the deep seated infection, yes. uh, deep seated foci. We can still yes. localize. So it all depends. Needles. I mean, if you think about ultrasound, when we use it, we use it to look at abdominal structures. So True. you can go anterior, you can look at the aorta. So you know, we have different ultrasound probes we use, um, which right. can help us to to get into different structures and different places and see different things. Yes, if it's a larger patient, it can definitely be more challenging. But that being said, it's not like I haven't stuck a needle into an obese patient under ultrasound and gotten fluid out. So in those cases, what's kind of helpful to us is when we have the MR, we have the other imaging, we know where the fluid is lying beforehand, then it becomes easier for us to do a targeted ultrasound and to target that particular spot that we want to get to. Right. So uh, the second question to that, the, the second part of this question was, uh, then do we switch that patient over to a CT guided biopsy? So, or or um, can we assess uh, collections on a CT as well? Yes, we can assess collections on CT. That's right. Absolutely. Um, what, what we find generally is when we're doing ultrasound guided procedures, we have a lot more flexibility on what we can do, ways we can approach and things we can do. Also as a technique, mm -hmm. it is much faster and more facile than using CT. So that's why what we, and, and it's also much cheaper for the patient. So what we normally try to do is say, we will try it and we will look under ultrasound guidance. If we can find it and we can get to it, brilliant. If for any reason we can't, then we'll move you over to a CT guided procedure. But we normally do it at the same time. Like we'll say, okay, we'll do ultrasound. If ultrasound is not happening, we'll move you over to CT. And we explain that to patients also. We tell them we're going to try to do it in the economic way first. If we find that for some reason it's not going to come through that way, then we'll move you over to CT. Let's say the blood parameters are, are uh, you know, just moderate grade. ESR is around 35. Patient just says pain. And then you have an MRI which suggests some kind of, uh, you know, membrane formation around the stem. Mm -hmm. Would you report that patient with, with some thigh pain because of loosened implants? Mm 
um, and the patient is walking with a limp, so the implants are not loosed, as as you 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 correctly pointed out. Would you point that or report that case of suspected infection, or what is your your, your uh, so your I wouldn't go down, points? Yeah. So one is I wouldn't go down the path of infection. If you have a mildly elevated ESR or borderline CRP, I'm not going to jump to infection. I think what we do then in many of these cases is, is you know, we, we follow tincture of time. So first thing I would do is say, I would say, let me, for, I would like to see if there are older studies and current studies. So I'd ask for that first, because remember one thing we always talk about in radiology is old films are your best friend. Mm-hmm. So I would ask for old films and say, look, is anything changing between these films or are we just steady? The second thing I would say is, okay, if we, if we're, if we're steady, we see early some, you know, some changes, some minor loosenses, but, and the patient has a little bit of a limp, yes, and bless you. Uh, then I would say that um, if you have a little bit of a limp uh, and, and a little bit of pain, I'd say, look, it's possible that this is happening, but this is not definitive at this point in time. Um, we'd start to say, okay, what are the other things we can do to make, a, make this a little bit more definitive? The first question I'd ask you is, if we make this more definitive, so let's say you say there's membrane formation and there's early loosening, are you going to do anything to this patient right now? So if you turn around to me, yeah, if you tell me this is going to be loose, or this is early loosening, I'm going to go in and do something about this. If you tell me, well, if it's early loosening, I might still continue to watch the patient. And I'd say, well, then let's just continue to watch the patient. Right? If we say that, no, I'm, I want to continue to watch the patient, but I'd like some quantitative parameter based on which I can say this is getting better or worse. Now I'll say, okay, fine. Then maybe let's do a bone scan. Let's do a bone scan, which will show us where the areas of uptake are, how much uptake there is. If the bone scan is clean, then you're home free. You're saying that's not even the issue at all. You know, there's no early loosening or anything like that. If the bone scan is positive, we say, okay, it's mildly positive in X, Y, Z locations. Let's just continue to follow this. Let's see whatever else we can do in terms of medical management that's available. And then we repeat this in two, three or four months, depending on how the patient is doing. If the patient continues to say, look, it's still mild pain, it's still mild pain. And we repeat the bone scan and say, look, nothing has changed or nothing is stable. And then you make your call on what you want to do at that stage. Does that make sense? That's right. That's right. I know if I can come in here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, for this particular question, uh, I think all the definitions for a uh, prosthetic joint infection do not include any form of X-ray, sonography, MRI at all. It's all based on you know what you see on um, serum markers and yeah. probably, modified go down the route of an aspiration. probably go down the route of an aspiration is what I would do first. I would probably call Aditya mm-hmm. tell him, look, I'm suspecting an infection. It's deep. It's deep. Can you aspirate it from me under ultrasound guidance? If we get fluid, then you culture it. We know it's mm-hmm. there or not there. And that's the reason why I think mm-hmm. most societies have done away with including things like an MR. Uh, you know, to kind of define an infection because the signs are not clear on that. So you so, can't really say it. Right. So one thing here I was asking was, um, I didn't, the question I don't think was targeted purely at infection. It was targeted a little bit also at the point of loosening. You just have a patient who has, who has thigh pain and a limp, right? And Correct. you have very borderline clinical markers for borderline serum markers for infection. Correct. But then if what happens first, is, if your first concern is infection in that case, then obviously you're going to aspirate. The only thing you want to know before you aspirate or put a needle in is, is there fluid or is there not fluid, which you can do two ways. A, you can say that, okay, I'm just going to stick a needle in there and finagle around and see if I find fluid, or you're going to say, can I do an ultrasound or can I do an MR and at least demonstrate whether there's fluid or not, because then at least I know where to stick my needle in. Correct. Yeah, that's, that's the only thing. But the point I was referring to is you have a patient with very non-specific markers, no real imaging things, and just has pain. And you're trying to determine is this pain from early loosening or is this pain from something else altogether? Fair enough. <clears throat> Second thing, if I can ask you, yeah. uh, nuclear scans yes. or bone scans in general, mm-hmm. uh, the dictum that we follow is in the first year after a fresh arthroplasty, mm-hmm. you know, scans are going to be hot or mildly hot or have some uptake. Yes. So when is the right time to consider a scan if we are considering a scan? So if it's like within six months, the patient's come back. What are you considering the scan for? That's always the infection, yeah. 
What are you so most commonly? Yeah. So most commonly, the scans that I have seen people order are to uh, rule out infection. So if you're doing it to rule out infection, then first of all, straight off the bat, um, why would you do a nuclear scan? Correct. Correct. So no... I mean, what 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 I've seen a lot of people do is, uh, you know, they have patients. They've 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 done the blood counts. mildly raised markers nothing very sure of an infection you know there's no sinus there's no discharge from the wounds and you know okay you want to rule out infection or you suspect an infection and you get a bone scan done and this is within 4 months of the primary surgery bone scan is no use in that case so in today's day and age in that situation you don't want to do a bone scan right. because a bone scan will show you bone turnover there will be bone turnover around the prosthesis all the time it's just we used to do bone scans in the old days and the reason you would do a bone scan and and find increased uptake is when we look at a bone scan we're trying to look at is there increased vascularity along with increased uptake so in other words if we have a patient where we do a three phase bone scan we show there's increased blood flow there's uh, you know so there's increased arterial phase imaging uh, uptake there's increased uh, blood pool uptake and there's increased uh, you know delayed phase oh, uptake then we uptake. would say that maybe this could be infection or a more aggressive process if you look at just remodeling of bone four months after then usually the early phase and mid phase imaging will be negative whereas it will only be the late phase that has got some increased uptake okay. that is one thing but that being said it's still not a good test to do when okay. you are talking about somebody where you say that listen i've got a low grade concern for infection i believe by this time by 4 months the amount of bone remodeling should have reduced dramatically you can consider at that point in time saying listen what i would do is an fdg pet scan because that is a scan that looks at glucose uptake and you say okay yeah. i want to see that whether there is any uptake or not and when you look at that you can do that for two reasons one is if you don't have uptake you're home free you say okay there's no uptake there's no infection but because it's four months post arthroplasty and the patient has got some pain you expect there to be some uptake but what you've created is you've created for yourself some sort of a semi quantitative baseline hmm. and you say look this this pet ct scan also gives us only like i am thinking clinically all my signs are plus minus the pet ct is also plus minus but we have a baseline now let's wait let's wait to if we obviously if you have fluid that you can aspirate you aspirate it but if everything is now all equivocal at this stage we say let's just wait there's nothing to be done at this stage let's just wait and then what we do is another 2 3 months later we repeat all this stuff and if it's showing that it is is it has it just continues to get better then you say okay this is probably not infection it's something else if it's getting worse then we start to think of maybe this is an infection that's happening but either way it's something that's very low grade uh another point aditya um Does that make sense, or are you guys? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. So, Absolutely. So, a lot of patients come with um, post arthroplasty. You know, they come with issues like a psoas tendonitis, mm -hmm. or a trochanteric uh, bursitis, or mm -hmm. glute med tendonitis. You know, right. uh, we've dealt with a couple of patients like that. You know, ourselves, the two of us. Right. Um, and uh, so, would you consider giving an injection? straight off if you're doing an ultrasound and you're seeing psoas tendonitis or you know what 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 would you want us to uh uh tell you about the patient so that you know you can make the decision then and there yeah so i think the most important thing is that we are not dealing with infection any time we're putting an injection the first thing we want to know is that we're not dealing with infection so we should be all clear from all parts that there's no infection if we are clear on that then then it's something to you know and then and, and the second thing is that we have exhausted all conservative means of managing that condition so if we said that okay you have you know we think there's impingement or we think there's tendinosis or tendinitis um we know that imaging wise this can be a occult or b we see enough patients who have tendinitis who don't have symptoms we have enough patients who have mild tendinitis and horrible symptoms and we have many patients with horrible tendinitis and no symptoms right so we we know the whole gamut so i would say the first thing is to clear out that we don't have um you know we do, we, we have no infection the second thing is to make sure that if whatever on our clinical basis we were diagnosing we have some imaging correlate that says either a it's there or it's not there it doesn't matter but that we've investigated it 
three uh, we have followed all the possible conservative measures to manage that condition whether it be non steroidals whether it be some sort of physio whether it be icing whether it be heat we've given them all those trials of all of it and then the patient is still coming back and says no but now i still need to do something at that stage i think i'm willing to talk about injections and then go ahead and doing it so if you're going to prep somebody and say alte can you look at this and you know inject if needed then you would just tell me alte we've seen this patient there's no signs of infection at all the patient has had chronic symptoms of this kind which are corresponding to this thing we've done some basic imaging to show that there's no major abnormality here and um uh, you know we've tried something physio wise but it's not really working out we need to take it to the next level at that stage i think it makes sense to start exploring injections great super and um in terms of you know if 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 we need to order a mri scan mm-hmm. for a post arthroplasty patient mm-hmm. you know the mars protocol or are there different protocols now that are being followed um, or do we not mention anything like that and just leave it to the radiologist to decide yeah so uh, just for your this thing mars is the nothing called but something called metal artifact reduction sequences okay uh, the original term came out of ge where they named it mars and ultimately siemens has something called cmac philips has something else so that is out of syllabus for all of us the main thing to think about is you say please do a magnetic susceptibility reduction artifact sequence if possible and for for a long time we didn't even use this we just we just configured our mr scanner to get images in a different way so i think leave that to the radiologist to decide just say i need to do arthroplasty imaging make sure you to send it to some radiologists who are at least familiar with arthroplasty imaging because if you send it to somebody else they may not get the sequences right they're not doing things regularly and often times we do take cts along with them just because the artifact is very variable so um we'd rather you know if we if you're going to take this step of doing something we get all the images together so my thing would be like be more with the status post total hip or total knee arthroplasty tell us how long post arthroplasty it is tell the patient to bring all their old images when they come to us for that scan and say please you know i'm concerned about loosening osteolysis infection whatever things you're concerned about and or if you want to know about alignment so i i have an interesting case some there are some surgeons who say whatever you do do not mention the alignment patients read it and run all over the place um so then right. they'll say listen just write the alignment down or just call me up and tell me what the alignment is or send me a picture of the alignments but don't put them on paper and there are others who say just put it on paper i just want to know it anyway so give it to me so i think just yeah. communicate you know whichever way you want on on what you what information you would like um sometimes in the beginning when you're working with someone a phone call helps today whatsapp is a great way to send someone here i'm sending so and so for an image this 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 like in our practice if you send me a message whatsapp it goes straight to my admins already the moment they see that scan they pretty much put your whatsapp message into my notes so we know that okay this was a case this is what we're looking for this is what it was so we always have that documented and these patients um if if we're sending them for an mri mm-hmm. um does it matter whether we send you know if the patients get a scan done from a 3 tesla mri or 1.5 tesla mri or that doesn't really matter it it actually does a little bit so if it's a 3 tesla scan, so the the magnetic susceptibility artifact is higher with a 3 tesla scanner than with a 1.5 tesla scanner so the 1.5 tesla That's scanner right. gives us nicer images but that being said nicer images we have magnetic susceptibility artifact reduction software which can make our 3 tesla images also readable okay. so given a preference i would say if you have magnetic susceptibility artifact reduction software on a 1.5 tesla scanner that's much nicer but sometimes what ends up happening is for example we have a center in marine lines which has a 1.5 t scanner but everywhere else it's a 3 t scanner and the patient lives in malad then we're going to say listen just go to the malad center you don't expect to schlep all the way to marine lines for that we'll do the mr and we'll do the ct and we usually will give you whatever information you need from that i've not found that we would be lacking from a diagnosis perspective when we do one versus the other but certainly from the standpoint of giving you nicer images we probably get nicer images from the 1.5 and ct scans mm-hmm. um how often have you seen people ask for a 3d print model bone model and what's your take on that for i mean it helps us to plan the more complicated the more difficult cases yeah um 
but what's your take on the role of it how often is it being used is it being used more and more i see the uses i mean the use case that i have seen is variable um, most often that i see it being used is for complex pelvic fractures um every now and then i see some of the spine surgeons use it for complex spine surgery um post arthroplasty imaging one of the things that does happen is we do tend to see a fair amount of streak artifact um and so those 3d models may not turn out to be as exciting as as one would have hoped um okay. so so i think that makes it a little bit challenging sometimes but some of the guys who build these 3d models are very very talented they do a lot of stuff to remove artifact and give you some really good images and um, give you a really good 3d print so a lot of that pro- processing is not done by radiologists actually it's done more by the 3d team so teams. once you send it across to them yeah they'll they'll take care of that and then give you whatever information you want so we actually okay. would even you know go so far as to connect you to them say listen we need a 3d model of this we'll do the ct we'll give them the images and then uh, we can even connect you to the 3d team if you have specific questions on what you want in it or what you'd like they can do that uh, accordingly and give you more information on that great <clears throat> thank you so much aditya all right not at all my pleasure thank you so much and all the best everybody i hope you never have to send me a scan and you all have a wonderful and, uh, yes <laughs> lots to learn thank you all right great thanks Anup. everyone thank you so much thank you not at all my pleasure bye now bye good night sure bye. good night bye 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 thank you Jay good night bye bye thank you